Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our Harvard lectures. We are in volume 4. This is lecture number 24. We are with Paradise Lost, book number 10. Some have considered this the fallout book after the fall. Let's go ahead and say out loud that I need you, if, if you haven't done it, or I suggest if you haven't done it, you want to spend some time at LearnStrong.net, find the Harvard Classics link down the left-hand side there, and watch my other lectures as we get into book number 10. If you don't have that background, a lot of what we're going to talk about, you're going to struggle a little bit with. I just finished a uh, lecture over Paradise Lost Book 9, which is really the heart, the climax of Paradise Lost. And I just want to point out that even though I gave what amounted to about a two-hour lecture on Paradise Lost Book 9, I still want to just show to you that we are just scratching the surface, really just scratching the surface of this text. For example, let me just give you three really fast examples of ways in which we could go even further and deeper into this text if we wanted to. Think about this. Adam, after the fall, is ready to live like a savage in solitude, right? Um, which is kind of an interesting question to ask about the psychology and the sociology that are associated. Are we, in fact, social animals and long to be with other people? Adam, of course, asked for Eve as his helpmate, but then the minute things go sideways, he's ready to go and be by himself and live all alone. Of course, we think about the idea of Thoreau and his experiment of going to Walden, don't we? And that comes to mind immediately. How about this one? Let's point out three things about the serpent and Eve in the Book 9 um, uh, reading that we just finished pre uh, recently, right? Just to show that we could go deeper if we wanted to. For example, I just want to point this out to you. At, in Book 9, line 510, just to, just to, uh, just to show you um, that Milton is genius in every way, okay? Think about this one for a second. At line 510 to 514, if you want to run this down yourself, Scipio, the height of Rome, is the first of the line. With track oblique, uh, Satan is moving towards, uh, towards Eve. At first, as one who sought access but feared to interrupt, sidelong, he works his way, as when a ship, blah, 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 blah. If you look at those lines, those, uh, those um, five lines, um, the first letters of each one of those words is S-A-T-A-N. In other words, while Milton is literally describing Satan's movement, he literally puts the five letters of Satan's name there going down. That's, of course, impressive. More impressive, probably, the fact that Milton is blind when he's, to, when he's playing this game. By the way, I should point out, there's lots and lots of debate about what goes on in this Genesis 3 account. The, um, the serpent seed theory, I'll let you do your own research on this. It comes from any number of places, sometimes referenced from the 1 Timothy 2, uh, verses 13 through 14 passage. Adam was not deceived, and in the Latin, uh, sometimes that word deceived was understood as the word seduced. And there's this whole line of thinking that, in fact, in the story, Eve sleeps with Satan and then produces a certain kind of race of people. This, of course, can lead to all kinds of racism. Who, who are these people? Even sometimes this was understood to be the Jews. It's a disgusting kind of understanding. But I just want to point out, there's a lot of different ways this stuff gets read. You can prove anything, right, from a text if you're willing to go deep enough. How about this one? Finally, Matthew 4, Luke 4, we call those the temptations of Christ when Christ and Satan are face to face. But what we find fascinating is that here there's no mention whatsoever of the Genesis 3 story. In other words, you might expect for Christ to say to Satan, you know, I know that you fooled Eve um, in that whole story back in, uh, you know, in Genesis 3, but you're not going to fool me. None of that is mentioned. Ironically, by Matthew 10, 16, Christ is suggesting that he sends out his servants and he tells them that they need to be wise like snakes, which is kind of fascinating. By the way, we should point out, 
So much of Christian theology will come back to the Genesis 3.15 passage that we will see several times now in Book 10. And Milton will write his famous Paradise Regained, a text that you and I will study together uh, later, to try to talk about why that's such an important moment in Christian theology. Okay, let's review really quickly. Um, the books that we have that we've covered so far. We're going to do this really fast because the assumption is again you've been with me for all these lectures. And I should point out if you've hung with me all the way to now book ten, you need to give yourself a major applause and a pat on the back because that's no small feat. I like I said to you when we began this project, if you can get through the reading of Paradise Lost, dude, you can pretty much read anything that's going to be thrown at you. Your confidence in your ability to read should be sky high if you've gotten this far. Let's just review. In book one, of course, we have the invocation. We meet Satan fallen on, this, on the lake of fire. Of course, pandemonium is created. In book two, of course, you have the plan. Satan is going to escape through his long journey, meet sin and death. And of course, that's going to be sin and death is going to be big for us in book 10. We'll get to it in a moment. Uh, book three, we meet the Father, we meet the Son, the need for a, a redemption, and we're going to have this exchange again here in book 10 uh, between Father and Son. Book four, we meet Adam and Eve. Go back and look at that lecture again. It's such an important lecture to understanding book 10. The idea of the patriarchy is constructed. The idea that it is an organic view that God has created the world in such a way. And again, this begins in large measure in the West as well with Aristotle. And men are above women and are designed, created to control their women. And if they don't do it, bad things are going to happen. We're going to, of course, see this played out and instantiated one more time again in Book 10. And again, without getting so upset that you just stop reading because you're like, I can't believe anybody actually believes this crap anymore, that kind of thing. The challenge that I always give to you is... Let's read. Let's entertain ideas. Let's challenge ourselves. Book 5, 6, we have the major flashback, Raphael's visit, Satan's uh, war, and ultimate falling out of heaven. Book 7 is that amazing uh, celebration of the cave, uh, uh, of the uh, creation story, right? Book 8, Raphael's warning about too much knowledge as well as his warning to Adam, look out for Eve. Of course, this will come back and will in fact remind us just as an aside, do you remember at the beginning of Othello what Desdemona's father says in a, just a brief comment to Othello about she fooled me, she could fool you. And of course, we're going to have the same idea being played out here in uh, Book 10. Of course, Book 9 that we just finished, the fall does happen. And of course, all of the different falls we should point out, right? Not just one fall, but multiple falls happening. Now to Book 10. And as we say, the fallout or the implication of what's happened or transpired in Book 9. Just to remind, three levels of reading. What does a text say? Summary. What does the text mean here? Level 2A. Messages, themes to be rhetorical. Not what Milton says, but how Milton says it. And then finally, how does this text at Level 3, how do I relate this text to other texts, 3A, and to the world? And then finally, how do I relate it, 3B, to myself? Also, let's just remind that we've been saying in all of our previous lectures, and I hope this has been a prism that has been able to be useful for you. We're reading Paradise Lost from at least three different perspectives. One, obviously we want to see it as an amazing epic poem, right? And for example, in Book 10, we're going to watch how he builds off of, for example, a poet like uh, Dante in the, the Divine Comedy, uh, more particularly the Inferno. We're going to see Paradise Lost as a book, uh, a, a, a text of philosophy and theology. Again, the idea of theodicy, why is it the case that a world created by an all-powerful, all-loving deity has pain, suffering, sin, etc., etc.? Of course, Milton's answer in a word is free will. The ability for humans to be able to choose to obey or disobey God is central to Milton's project. Finally, we look at Paradise Lost as a work of politics from two perspectives. The psychological, that is to say the individual mind, and sociological, that is to say when you put two people or more together. And in regards to Book 10, we're going to see the genius again of Milton as he plays that one out. Let's now turn to Level 1, and as we have done in all of our earlier lectures, let's turn to the argument itself of Book Number 10. And we'll just read it, and then we'll give a brief plot summary before we actually get into this. The argument, Book 10. 
man's transgression known. The guardian angels forsake paradise and return up to heaven to approve their vigilance and are approved. God declaring that the entrance of Satan could not be by then prevented. God sent them on an impossible task. He sends his son to judge the transgressors who descends and gives sentence accordingly. Then in pity, clothe them both and reascends. Sin and death, sitting still then at the gates of hell, by wondrous sympathy, feeling the success of Satan in his new world and the sin of man there committed, resolved to sit no longer confined in hell, but to follow Satan, their sire, up to the place of man to make the way easier from hell to this world to and fro. They pave a broad highway or bridge over chaos, highway to hell, right? According to the track that Satan first made. Then, preparing for earth, they meet him, proud of his success, returning to hell, their mutual gratulation. Satan arrives at pandemonium in full assembly, relates with boasting his success against man. Instead of applause, is entertained with a general hiss by all his audience, transformed with himself also, suddenly into serpents, according to his doom given in paradise. Then, deluded with a show of the forbidden tree springing up before them, they greedily reaching to take of the fruit, chew dust and bitter ashes. You'll never think again of the term ash tree again the same way after you've uh, read book 10. The proceedings of sin and death, God foretells the final victory of his son over them and the renewing of all things, but for the present commands his angels to make several alterations in the heavens and elements. Adam, more and more perceiving his fallen condition, heavily bewails, rejects the condolement of Eve. She persists and at length appeases him. Then, to evade the curse likely to fall on their offspring, proposes to Adam violent ways, suicide, which he approves not. But conceiving better hope puts her in mind of the late promise made them that, their, that her seed should be revenged on the serpent and exhorts her with him to seek peace of the offended deity by repentance and supplication. So a lot is going to happen. I mean, you can obviously tell by the length of an argument at the beginning of one of Milton's books of Paradise Lost just how much stuff's going down here. Let's summarize, though, the three major parts of this, of this uh, book number 10. First of all, You've got to have the judgment session, the sentencing, of course. The son is going to do this, sent by the father. This will, of course, be a, uh, something we've seen earlier in Paradise Lost. Number two, we're going to have the unholy trinity, as we're going to call it. We're going to see that there's a number of threes or trinities in this book 10. But here it's going to be sin, death, and Satan. The highway of hell is going to be constructed. Sin and death will bring into the world all of the terrible things that will explain why, to go back to an earlier lecture, we have children who die of leukemia in hospital rooms. Satan will go back to hell. He tells his story about how great he's done. He expects every, all of the demon angels to applaud him, but instead they start hissing because they are going to be changed into snakes. It's going to be a brilliant moment for us as we read it. And then they're going to see a tree there that, that looks very much like the tree in paradise. They believe that the apple from that tree will give them at least sustenance. They bite into it and it's nothing but ash. It's an interesting word picture. And again, we can't help but think of Dante's Inferno when we play that game. Finally, number three. And really what, for my thinking, is some of the most amazing poetry of all of Paradise Lost. Adam, sitting all alone, reminding us very much of Hamlet in the middle of that play, will begin to muse to himself in the form of a dramatic monologue or a soliloquy what his state now is. It is a compelling moment. We'll try and read as much of it as we can together here in a moment. Ultimately, Eve is going to beg Adam to forgive her, and they go through an interesting exchange that includes the possibility of them thinking about suicide, and then finally they decide against that plan, and instead they do what Satan will never do. They humbly beg God for forgiveness. We will, of course, see that in Book 11 and Book 12, then, God's forgiveness will come in the form of a prophecy, a story that will be related from the great Archangel Michael. We'll get to it. I wish, as I have said in the past, I wish uh, for all these lectures that I could read every line of this to you. 
and then I could exegete as I go. Instead, I'm just going to have to work with the amount of time that I've got available to me. But let's jump right now into the uh, book 10, and let's, uh, let's spend a few minutes now just talking through this amazing set of poetic lines that we're going to find ourselves in. First of all, we've got sad angels. Sad, why? Two reasons. They screwed up. They feel, anyway, they screwed up. And they allowed Satan into paradise, and of course, uh, Satan did what Satan did. Uh, secondly, they have a, a level of pity. We immediately, again, will think back to our earlier lecture on Book 9 um, of Paradise Lost. And you'll remember that there we started with Aristotelian views of poetics, where, in tragedy, the audience will feel a sense of pity for the protagonist who has fallen, and, and, the, and the angels feel pity for Adam and for Eve who have fallen. Right. Uh, at line 18, we're told that they are mute and sad. At line 34, God will speak to them and begin to say, hey, look, this was a useless mission that I sent you on. At line uh, 43 to uh, 50, he says it, no decree of mine concurring to necessitate his fall, Adam and Eve's fall. Right? Or touch with lightest moment of impulse his free will to her own inclining left in even scale. In other words, he says it. Again, this is Milton's argument. He keeps saying it over and over again to quote the lines from Hamlet. Me think the lady doth protest too much. Here, it's Milton's attempt to try to keep saying, you can't blame God. In fact, notice what he really says is, to blame God for the, for the evil of the world is, the, is a satanic argument. It's Satan's argument. And notice here, um, he says it. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't mess around with free will. I had to give them the opportunity to eat from the forbidden fruit or they could not be understood as completely free. Now, again, not completely ever answered by Milton is the question, why would God need to create Adam and Eve in the first place, free or otherwise, what's the point of a perfect being creating anything? I mean, doesn't isn't it always true that need precedes some act of creation? Blah, blah, blah. Of course, one of the arguments Milton will give is, well, there were a lot of, a lot of people lost out of, uh, people, angels, lost out of heaven, and because that's the case, we have to repopulate heaven, and the way we'll do it is through earth, blah, blah, blah. Uh, by the way, this thing about the scales, just to go back to the um, end of book four, line 999, you'll maybe remember that we have the divine scales that actually allow, for Gabriel, allow Satan to escape um, uh, at, at line, at line um, 40, uh, 45 or so. But fallen he is, man. And now, what rests but that the mortal sentence pass on his transgression, death denounced that day, which he, Adam, presumes already vain and void, because not yet inflicted as he feared. In other words, Adam thinks that the minute you eat from the tree, you're going to die. What he doesn't understand is that that death does not have to come right away. It can come later. It will come later. Uh, we continue. Uh, line 68 and, so, and following. The sun will respond. He says, I will go. I will pass judgment. And sure enough, that's exactly what he does. At line 97, I'm going quickly through these lines. Again, I wish I could read all of this with you, but you obviously are reading on your own. At line 97, the voice of God they hear. Adam and Eve are hiding. Of course, they're hiding um, in the shade among the trees, right? We think back to Adam again at the end of book 9, say, I wish that I could just hide forever, uh, live the savage life of solitude under the pine trees, right? We're also reminded that Eve herself was born in shade, not in sunlight, like Adam, of course, all of that major setup for, for Milton. And then at line 103, the questions will begin. I've often thought it's a fascinating thing to study these questions of, of deity. Notice the first one is, where are you? Right? Um, this is an interesting ontological and existential question, isn't it? Where are you, Adam, at line 103? And, uh, of course, Adam doesn't want to respond, right? Um, finally, he, um, uh, he comes out, they do come out, at line 1111 11 or so. Love was not in their looks, either to God or to each other, but apparent guilt and shame and perturbation and despair, anger, obstinates, obstinacy, hate, Guile, by the way, if you want to add up all of those, that's an interesting number of all the things that they're feeling. And then at line 1116, Adam struggles to speak. I want to point this out. This is just one more brilliant way for Milton to talk about the many falls. Before the fall, 
language seems to come just so naturally, so articulate. And again, although Milton, the great linguist, doesn't ever actually ask what language is it that's being spoken at the very beginning, be that as it may, it is, we're going to hear the word loquacious. It is beautiful elocution. But now, language starts to break down. What is it that the speaker of, of Prufrock says, T.S. Eliot's love song of J. Alfred Prufrock? It is impossible to say just what I mean. Uh, Adam struggles to speak at line, one, um, at line uh, 116. And then at line 121, he will say it. Um, the, the question, hast thou eaten of the tree that I gave thee charge thou shouldst not eat? Right? The question is asked. And then and Adam finally will speak at line 125. Oh, Heaven makes us think about old woman earlier, right? In book nine, in evil strait, this day I stand before my judge. Uh, he he realizes that he's that he's jacked. At line one thirty seven, finally he gets around to it. Although he does consider the potentiality that maybe what he'll do here is not say anything. Um, about Eve and take all of the blame himself, but he knows that ultimately God's going to know anyway, and so he says it at line one, at line one thirty, uh, at line one thirty-seven. This woman, whom thou madest to be my help and gavest me as thy perfect gift, so good, so fit, so acceptable, so divine, that from her hand I could suspect no ill. And what she did, whatever in itself her doing seemed to justify the deed, she gave me of the tree and I did eat, to whom the sovereign presence thus, thus replied. In other words, Adam basically says, okay, a couple of things. One, uh, the, this woman that you gave to me as a helper ended up being not so much of a helper. But number two, she seemed to think it was going to be for good. In other words, he seems to kind of almost try and take away some of the accusation or accusatory nature that he's speaking towards, towards Eve. Um, the interesting question, and here we go, obviously, with Milton's patriarchy and, of course, his misogyny as well. The question, was she thy God? This is, of course, extra-biblical. It's not in the Genesis 3 account that we read in an earlier lecture. Right? Was she thy God, that her thou didst obey before his voice? Or was she made thy God?